Okay, hi everybody. Richie, can you hear me? Just give me a thumbs up. Good. All righty. Hi everybody. Welcome. Tonight's lecture is formally titled the Brendan Gill Lecture, and it's a longtime annual event at the Yale School of Architecture. Endowed by Yale College and Yale School of Architecture graduate Herb McLaughlin in 1987, it honors the famed architectural critic Brendan Gill. Gill graduated from Yale College in 1936 and went on to write criticism for The New Yorker, not only about architecture and the cityscape, but also film, theater, and literature, as, met, as well as many profiles and talk of the town pieces, more than 1,200 pieces in all in the 60 years that he was at The New Yorker. Herb McLaughlin's widow uh, continues to be a generous and ongoing supporter of financial aid at the school. She couldn't join us tonight as she usually does, but she sends everybody in the audience her warm regards. The Brendan Gill Lecture always brings us writers of note, and tonight it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Kate Wagner, a critic whose comments and insights I have long enjoyed and almost always agree with. Um, Kate is a critic in the traditional sense, but she also has an Instagram account, McMansion Hell, that makes me laugh out loud, truly. I turn to it for pleasure. And if that version of her work is a visual short essay that lives on your phone the way it lives on mine, her blog, also called McMansion Hell, is a long, hilarious novel, except everything in it is true. Um, so I highly recommend both. Since its launch in 2016, the blog has been featured in a wide range of publications, including the Huffington Post, Slate, Business Insider, and Paper Magazine. And beyond McMansion Hell, Kate has been a contributor to 99% Invisible, Atlas Obscura, The Baffler, The Atlantic, City Lab, and The Nation, among many other publications and news sources. She is, was, I'm not quite sure, a columnist at Curbed. Uh, you can raise a thumb or not if I got that right, and a regular columnist at the New Republic. In addition to writing about architecture, Kate has worked extensively as a sound engineer with expertise in recording, engineering, product development, and research. She's a graduate of Johns Hopkins University and the Peabody Conservat Conservatory, where her focus was on acoustics and the design of concert halls. Before graduate school, Kate studied music composition at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and she is now living in Chicago, which is where she is speaking to us from tonight. That was not a good sentence. Um, one of the things I enjoy about Kate's writing, especially her opinion pieces, is her willingness to cover design as it relates to politics, labor, democracy, suburbia, and capitalism in whatever mixture of these components that is right for the designed object, place, space, or environment being reviewed. If you enjoy McMansion Hell and wonder about the images, you may also enjoy this anecdote. Kate received a cease and desist letter from the online real estate marketplace Zillow for using photos from their website, which had put the parody architecture blog and Wagner even more into the spotlight. It is my understanding that after getting assistance from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, an organization I enormously believe in and support, it was determined that the photos were fair use. Zillow dro dropped its threat and Kate Wagner seems to continue to use Zillow images, uh, to my mind, not unlike Sherry Levine or Richard Prince in their appropriation-based work. So we are delighted that she's gonna be speaking to us tonight. Please join me in welcoming this year's Brendan Gill lecturer, Kate Wagner, for her talk, Embracing the Discourse, New Horizons in Architectural Criticism. And one second before you start, Kate, at the end of the lecture, Kate will take questions from the audience. You can enter them into the Q&A feature and uh, Ruchi will direct them to Kate. So thanks so much, everybody, and welcome, Kate. Thank you. Let's see, I think slides are coming up here. There we go, here's some slides. All right, so first of all, uh, I would like to thank a few people, uh, Dean Burke and the Yale School of Architecture for their generous invitation to give such a prestigious lecture. I'd also like to thank my editors, Chris Simon and Laura Reston at the New Republic for giving me a fantastic platform for speaking about design. And of course, I mean, not to be too cheesy, I want to say hi to my mom and dad and all of my friends and colleagues who are in the audience, thanks to Zoom. Okay, slide. 
So I this this talk is in three parts here. So the first part is going to be on writing uh, my process, et cetera, and the second part on criticism, and the third part will be sort of a manifesto of sorts. Uh, so let's do slide again here. We now be at okay slide. There we go. That's good. No more slides. Okay. If you asked me in 2016 when I was an unair conditioned grad student living in the top floor of an old factory with five other people, all of them men, where I thought I'd be four years from now, I would have said something pithy, probably like, hopefully not in poverty. Uh, if you said I'd be giving the Brendan Gill lecture at the Yale School of Architecture, I would have frankly laughed at you. If you say, hey, Kate, you're going to be an architecture critic, I would have just stared blankly at you because an architecture critic is one of those things people don't really become anymore. When I started McMansion Hell, I was in between an undergrad in music composition and a graduate degree in audio science. I thought I was going to work a desk job looking at reverberation time spreadsheets for a living if I was lucky. I started the blog as a joke between me, my ex-boyfriend, and a mutual friend. And the long story short is it went viral. And I want to say that going viral is something that happens to you. An insurance company would classify it as an act of God. I quit my job as an intern at a loudspeaker company and began writing full time. Later, building my career over the course of the last four years by freelancing at bigger and bigger publications, culminating in having a print column in the New Republic devoted to architecture and design. By 2016, uh, I've been reading and writing about architecture for about eight or nine years. My one regret, of course, is that I can't give this lecture at the Yale School of Architecture proper because of COVID, because Paul Rudolph, who designed that building, is my favorite architect. And seeing the Goshen Government Center, the Orange County Government Complex, if you want to get technical, at the age of 13 was what got me into architecture in the first place. And I spent my high school years writing poems and music about architecture and lurking in the skyscraper city forums. Uh, on brutalism while listening to Steve Reich. That's, I, yeah. I wanted to be an architect at one point, uh, but was discouraged by my high school guidance counselor because I got B's instead of A's in math. And uh, I was a decent enough classical musician to go to school for it. And so that's what I did. And all this is to say that architecturally speaking, I'm self-taught. And I feel that this is very important to point out, especially in a, in a forum such as this. And it's something that I used to be ashamed of, but have now embraced over the years. And I have a deep love for the vernacular and what is the vernacular if not the lasting built efforts of the self-taught. I've titled this talk, Embracing the Discourse, for borrowing a pejorative term, the discourse, from Twitter parlance, meaning a lot of sparring of words for the sake of pure argument and hype and attention that's inherent to the online world and the way that it shapes us. This isn't a lecture about architecture, but it is a lecture about architecture criticism and the new horizons I think it should strive for, lest it be cast into irrelevancy, many of which involve the internet or at least discuss the way the internet has shaped the institution of criticism. In some ways, it's fitting to me that the internet's architecture critic gives this lecture via Zoom rather than in person. While I've sat on my fair share of juries over the years, I rarely get the opportunity to speak directly to prospective students in history, theory, or criticism. I know many of you would like to embark on the journey to hopefully becoming an architecture critic or historian of architecture or a participant in architectural discourse, whether on Twitter or in the halls of academia. And so first, before I get into criticism, I'm going to take this rare opportunity to talk about how I approach writing about architecture. And I hope that this will be of use to some of you. Slide. Slide, there we go. I see myself as a writer first, and I choose to write about architecture as a subject simply because I love architecture more than anything else in the world, literally. And I write for people who don't look at buildings like you and I do, you and I meaning me and those of you who are watching who are Yale students. I write for the people who do a double take in their cars when they pass by a particularly intriguing house, people who stay home on a Friday night to watch HGTV. People who interact with space as users and consumers, not necessarily as creators. People for whom architecture is the canvas upon which everyday life is painted. People who love their houses and their cities something fierce. And so when I write about architecture, I try to tell a story. I try to humanize my subject unless I find it unworthy of the gesture, in which case I resort to humor, something I believe imperative to the project of criticism because architecture takes itself so, so seriously. 
this is not to say that I'm not a serious scholar, despite being self-taught. I have a great love of theory and a bookshelf arsenal full of theorists whose work I enjoy and return to often. I even subscribe to log, despite how expensive it is. Still, I'm not a theorist and I do not write like a theorist unless I'm writing about concert halls from the 70s. Because as a critic, my work is public facing and theory is not. The great privilege of theory, however, is that it has a lovely intimacy to it, cloistered away in university libraries and heated conversations that go deep into the night. It fills long papers with languidly looping references, snippets of my pet favorites, a dash of Doug Spencer mixed with Pierre Vittorio Aurelli, embedded gemstone all alike in Times New Roman double space. Criticism doesn't have that intimacy. It's all authority, panache, performance. And so why not make the performance a good one? Right now I'm working on a piece about Allison and Peter Smithson, the godparents of brutalism. And so of course I turn to my bookshelf. In the new brutalism, Banham, Maynard Banham introduces our subjects as thus. The most obstinate protagonists of that type of architecture, referring to the pure forms of Mies, at the time in London were Allison and Peter Smithson, designers of the Miesian school at Hunsinson, which is generally taken to be the first brutalist thing. The term brutalist was doubtless applied to their ideas lightly and in passing, but it stuck to them for two reasons. Firstly, because they were prepared to make something serious of it. And secondly, because Peter Smithson was known to his friends during his student days as Brutus from a supposed resemblance to classical busts of the Roman hero. I don't know if I believe that. When Peter Smithson finally committed the phrase to print in November of 1953, the situation had already developed so far that no word but brutalism could have ever served to express what the Smithsons and many others of their generation urgently felt they must express, even if they had as yet no architecture to express it. This is a good introduction. It conveys the youthful agency of the Smithsons and their ideas, humanizes them as excitable students who see themselves on the cusp of something bigger than themselves. And I now turn to Frampton, uh, Kenneth Frampton, because I'm quite fond of his particular analysis of new brutalism. And he takes a more critical view head on in, in modern architecture. He says, split between a sympathy for old fashioned working class solidarity and the promise of consumerism, the Smithsons were ensnared in the intrinsic ambivalence of an assumed populism. Through the second half of the 1950s, they moved away from their initial sympathy for the lifestyle of the proletariat more towards middle class ideals that depended on their appeal on both that depended their appeal on both conspicuous consumption and mass ownership of the automobile. Dot, dot, dot. Meanwhile, at a domestic scale, they continued to regard the chromium consumer product in the crumbling tenement or the plastic interior as the ultimate liberating icon of their conciliatory style. Frampton has the benefit of hindsight on Bannum on, in this case, whose work was written in much earlier and from the perspective of someone who knew the Smithsons and lived through the development of brutalism as an architectural movement in England. However, both get at the essential kernel of the story. The Smithsons saw themselves as radical disruptors of the modern status quo in England and Europe more broadly with lasting ramifications, including the end of the Siam. That's the Congress International International Architecture Modern. And so to some, my French is terrible. And so to some extent that was true, but ultimately they were two well-meaning if self-important young people in the, at the mercy of a rapidly changing political aesthetic and cultural post-war development. This is a fascinating and complex story of generational warfare, of hubris and idealism, of the follies of youth, of which I have succumbed to many, of the failings of a leftism that's more aesthetic than political. Yet despite all this messiness, the young Smithson left an indelible mark on modern architecture, changed it forever, started a discourse about concrete bunkers and aesthetics and politics that carries on with the same vehemence to this very day. The question becomes, how do we blend the familiarity and humor of Bannum with the acerbic criticism of Frampton? How do we establish the scene of post-war Britain? How do we develop the Smithsons as the flawed protagonists they are in a way that captures the attention of people who have never heard of them, which probably includes many of you listening tonight. And so I write, way back in the 1950s, two British architecture students found each other, got married, and together set upon a course of action that would culminate in the disintegration of one of modern architecture's most powerful institutions. Their names were Addison and Peter Smithson. If you read any of the accounts of the Smithsons contemporaries, such as the New Brutalism by Rainer, critic historian Rainer Banham, one characteristic of the pair is constantly reiterated, reiterated. At the time of the rise to fame in British and international architecture circles, the Smithsons were young. Trapped generationally between post-war scarcity and the prosperity of post-war, uh, pre-war scarcity and the prosperity of post-war global capitalism, Enveloped in the contrasting sublimes of shrapnel wreckage and the slick, languid speed of a new automobile zero down, 
The Smithsons fancied themselves the kind of wide-eyed radicals native to Keynesianism, steeped in the aesthetics and language of proletarianism, but perfectly happy with the developments and consumption that added flushness to the gaunt faces of a traumatized nation. Allison and Peter said of the new brutalism, a term whose dubious background includes a sarcastic letter regarding Swedish architecture and the fact that Peter's nickname in architecture school was Brutus, that it was an ethic, not an aesthetic. The ethic in question united the hardy brusqueness of proletarian materials in the welfare state with an unflinching belief that a better world was possible without going too much into the specifics of how one brings about such a future. This to me is much more effective than simply saying in the 1950s, Allison and Peter Smithson invented brutalism by way of their Hunt Stanton school, which combined Miesian structural and compositional elements with a uniquely British proletarian materiality. So much writing in architecture is devoted to density. And I like to sprawl. Sprawl's bad, except for in writing, it's good in writing. To cramming in as many ideas into as few words as possible, making up new ones just to make the sentences more compact with the side effect of adding to a constantly expanding dictionary of jargon, to the point where one can easily forget that the subject of discussion at hand is in fact architecture. I mean, terms like tectonics, proletarian materiality, et cetera, are effective describing buildings in a certain analytical way, rather analogous to the way music theory is used to describe, discuss music in terms of secondary dominance in sonata form. That kind of analysis is necessary for the production of knowledge and the expansion of our understanding of architecture through the lens of contemporary technical, philosophical, and historical frameworks, which ostensibly is the job of theory. But the job of criticism to me is something different entirely. Slide. Slide. Oh no, did it freeze? Oh, there we go. I hope you like my slide. Architecture schools have graduated many students of art and or architectural history, but the ones who become critics had a special gift, which is the desire and the ability to educate and inform people outside of architecture. Historically, architecture critics have been architects themselves or historians of architecture at elite or notable institutions. Although a handful of the built environment's most enduring voices, such as Jane Jacobs, have been self-taught. This is in part to the nature, uh, due to the nature of the old school world of print publishing, when every major newspaper in the country had an architecture critic, a film critic, a food critic, a theater critic, a music critic. Generally, the cultural criticism was public facing. The goal of a Ada Louise Huxtable or a Lewis Mumford or a Nicholas Pevsner or a Michael Sorkin, rest in peace, was to act as an interlocutor between the world of architecture and the general populace, translating matters of aesthetics, history, and politics into a piece of writing that was easily accessible and often entertaining. As much as we lionize Ada Louise Huxtable today, in one of her last columns, she compared the then unbuilt Hudson Yards to a collection of glittering dildos, something I agree with and will forever cherish. What makes a good critic isn't the ability to analyze and deconstruct a building, though of course that is important, but rather the way one uses a building as a prism through which one can view life, politics, history, aesthetics, the world and its systems, the current culture and its zeitgeist, the human element from its architect to its inhabitants, to its janitor, to, its, to the city councilor with backdoor investments in real estate, to the neighbors being evicted to make room for the era's next Lincoln Center. And I mentioned the spirit of architectural criticism as a public good, and this is the main focus of what I want to discuss from here on out. I feel as though the spirit has been lost in recent decades for a number of reasons, some of more obvious than others. My favorite architecture theorist, the Italian architectural theorist Manfredo Tafuri, opened his 1960s book, The Theories and, His Theories and Histories of Architecture with a salient observation of the state of architectural criticism. To criticize, in fact, means to catch the historical scent of phenomena put them through the sieve of, of strict evaluation, show their mystifications, values, contradictions, and internal dialectics, and explode their entire charge of meanings. But in the period we live in, mystifications and brilliant aversions, historical and anti-historical attitudes, bitter intellectualizations, and wild mythologies mix themselves so inextricably in the production of art that the critic is bound to start on an extremely problematic relationship with his accepted operative practice, particularly in considering the cultural tradition in which he moves. She. In fighting a cultural revolution, there exists an inanimate, an intimate complicity between criticism and activity. To Furry's words, despite the intense density with which he always manages to cram so many ideas in so few sentences, something I envy, remain alarmingly true today. These problems, the mythification, mythology, historicalism, ahistoricism, intellectualism, 
complicity within exploitative economic and cultural systems embedded within the field of architecture had already begun to emerge mid-century and earlier, but would reach their apex, I feel, in our current era. Architecture exists as a field devoted to the ideals of suffering, overwork, hero worship, and the continuing myth of an often male genius. While I conceded earlier that a certain type of architectural analysis is necessary for the production of knowledge, to say that theory doesn't have its own problems would be frankly wrong. Slide. Oh, there we go. Since the dawn of the contemporary post Eisenmanian era of theory writing, so much of architectural writing has buried itself into an increasingly interesting academic isolation in which all of the serious thinking is done in journals or small underground publications run by grad students, neither of which I have access to anymore after I graduated. This is the layer of ics, isms, isations, the realm of rhizomes, actor, nectar, at work, actor network theory, new materialisms, whatever idea du jour philosophy departments have in store for us this time. So much so that one reads an academic journal of architecture theory and can easily forget that the topic of discussion is in fact buildings. The serious thinkers with tenure, with the exception of a small blessed few, remain in this realm for their entire lives, never having to face the public. That's not to say that good and important research isn't done in the academy, but rather to dispel the myth that every HTC graduate inherently has the skills or even the desire to become an architecture critic, and the desire is very important. On top of this layer adds, lies the domain of specialty and trade publications, that is, publications geared towards the field and ultimately the practice of architecture. Some of these, such as Metropolis and the Architectural Review, are relatively public-facing and familiar to those laymen who happen to be interested in design, whereas others, such as Places Journal or the Architects Newspaper, are tailored more to those working academically or professionally in the field of architecture or architectural history. Many of these publications are wonderful, and although their pay is unfortunately often lackluster, they have a large readership do sincere work in tackling the various current issues and ideas within the architecture world, akin to the role of ArtNet or hyperallergic play in the art world. Slide. On top of the, oh, sorry, on top of this layer is P architecture. I wrote about PR architecture uh, for the Architects newspaper, and I think it's somewhat useful to quote a little bit extensively from this particular essay because it shines a light on much of what is wrong, or at least what I think is wrong, with the state of architecture publishing. I mean, for those of you not in the know, PR architecture is essentially the architectural equivalent, equivalent of vaporware. Proposed projects, ideas, and innovations that generate a lot of hype and publicity and yet never materialize. And even when they do materialize, they do so in a muddled down form. It's architecture for the click economy, a product of the age of short attention spans and a constant uncritical drive towards the new and shiny. The architecture is the inevitable result of an image-driven, buzzword-laden media atmosphere where big ideas and sumptuous imagery are rewarded time and time again with attention, clicks, and opportunities over the work of up-and-coming or more critical and subversive practitioners. Its visual language is a computer rendering and its textual language adopts the self-congratulatory tone of public relations of savvy corporate rhetoric willing to capitalize on the issue du jour, often co conveniently covering up a brand or firm's unsavory contributions to the conditions from which those issues arise. We are living in unprecedented times with issue X and issue Y weighing heavily on our horizon, presenting us with an uncertain future, one blurb will say, while another parrots. The problem of X requires bold and innovative new solutions at the intersection of Y and Z. The time for action, is always now. Likewise, the solutions at these intersections of Y and Z are always surface level, technocratic at best and tone deaf at worst. The authors believe uncritically that design can and will solve all of our problems from climate change to income inequality. We'll solve the novel coronavirus with shipping container hospitals, climate change with floating cities and income inequality with 3D printed houses. Conveniently, all of these solutions are saleable, generating attention and income, click-based ad revenue or commissions, it's all the same really peddling them. It's a win-win situation. Your firm ends up on the front page of Dezine, plus you end up looking forward-thinking and compassionate to the plight of the unsophisticated masses who could truly benefit from your innovative ideas. Most of the time, you don't even have to go to the trouble of building anything. So here's the thing about building things. Producing buildings, it exposed architectural criticism, both aesthetically and politically. The act of making a building grounds architecture in the real world exposing complicity, complicity in the exploitative systems that facilitate and accompany the production of space, such as capitalism, late, fossil, racial, or otherwise. 
labor exploitation, income and racial inequality, oppressive political regimes, predatory financial institutions, and so on. By comparison, producing images is easy. It's cheap, doesn't require changes in a firm's own practices or even reflecting on what practices need changing. Images and PR spin can easily be attached to a timely problem. New technical develop, technological development, a brand, a personality. Even if the fit with the brief du jour, it can be shoehorned into the public eye regardless with the right combination of smooth publicity and content delivery. It's hard to say what a solution to this problem would look like as it's a systemic problem involving the entire industries of architecture and architecture journalism. There are obvious correctives such as diversifying workplaces and editorial reform, but these do not get at the heart of the issue, which is that architecture in an inequitable society will always be inequitable. And an inequitable, inequitable architecture will always resist or should that fail absorb the very project of criticism. I think often how telling it is how progressive practices, including my two favorite practices, working practices of all time right now, such as Peter Barber and Lakatan and Vassal, have in recent years been patronizingly held up as avatars of architecture's good conscience. The most powerful and successful architecture firms in the world thrive simply because the status quo rewards them for their work. They win huge contracts from NGOs and corporations, as well as huge publicity opportunities from other NGOs and corporations. The injury is the way because it is safe. Action and real novelty are risky, but safety is profitable and that profitability incentivizes homogeneity and ideological fecklessness. The same media landscape that sustains these behemoths also manages to toss a few crumbs to the small firms whose buildings are glamorous enough to look good on an Instagram feed. And this gives the appearance of neutrality and opportunity that keeps architects feeding into the image economy. So, hence, in addition to being a failure of architecture, peer architecture is also a failure of criticism, a failure of curation, and a failure of journalistic adaptation to a changing media landscape. PR itself is the very language of adaptation and curation. To fight a battle with it is like pitching a fight with the Hydra. Perhaps the simplest, most immediate solution to the PR problem is for a cultural shift in the field of architecture towards self-awareness, self-criticism, and self-skepticism regarding innovations technologies and proposals, it knows to be cynical, impossible, or simply stupid. For media, this is more difficult. For the entire ecosystem of digital media squeaks by off of outrage, clickbait, and attention grabbing. In the twilight years of print architecture criticism, the time is long since overdue for new, more diverse institutions of criticism to be built, and this is important, allowed to become an, as established and reputable as the old ones. These two solutions, of course, are band-aids, patching up leaks in what is a systemic crisis within architecture and a media that is both dependent on the vagaries and injustices of global capitalism. Slide. Oh, there we go. Since PR architecture makes up so much of the architectural press, a la social media, and the academy makes up so much of architectural thinking, and because previously reliable outfits for criticism such as newspapers and now ever volatile digital media companies are increasingly going up in smoke. You might be asking, I mean, what the hell, man? Okay, start new publications that are diverse, that let criticism happen. Cool, easier said than done, right? With what money? How long does it take for a person, a writer, much less an ent entire publication to become financially stable and high quality enough to survive, much less become legitimatized? I mean, I hope that someday that means the mean institutional support will become available to build those new spaces that lead criticism forward into a new, more ego egalitarian renaissance. However, I run a blog and I run it by myself because I cannot afford to pay anyone else a fair wage to write for me. Has that blog become over the years legitimatized or at least accepted as evidence by my presence here before you tonight? Sure. Are individual projects like McMansion held a way to build what we're calling the new criticism? Probably not. As I wrote recently in my letter to a young architect, which was published in the Architectural Review, what is becoming increasingly clear is that our critical intervention in architecture must happen collectively through organizing within the academy, the firm, and across the discipline. This is a beautiful project, and I say beautiful, because it involves every single one of us architectural practitioners, critics, and crucially workers. As you embark on your career as an architect or a critic or a historian or a writer or a lover of architect architecture, you must always remember that your critical voice matters and it's essential to making architecture a better, more equitable, more ethical, and yes, more critical profession. Because this is a collective project, it matters not if you are a sole practitioner, grad student, or employee stuck drawing wall sections in Revit for eight hours a day. 
there is always an opportunity for subversion activism. Personally, the winning strategy for me as a writer has been to use the notoriety of McMahon's from Hell to bring architecture criticism to other publications, large, widely circulated publications like The Atlantic or The New Republic, but also even niche or literary publications like The Baffler and political outlets like Jacobin, whose pages don't usually see much or sometimes even any discussion of architecture. The obvious problem with this is that some people will be given these opportunities much more regularly than others, following the basic prejudices of society with regard to race, class, ability, age, and gender. A funny story. For the first six months of McMansion Hell, everyone assumed I was a man. A not so funny story. On every panel I've ever been on, I have been at least 15 years younger than everyone else and often the only woman. The only winning strategy has the other winning strategy has been to utilize the new crowdfunding structures like Patreon, Kickstarter, whatever, to secure enough of a living wage to keep my voice independent and my life stable. This is something that some projects such as the freelance uh, freelance organization, working group slash media reporting outlet study hall, which I recommend you check out if you write, are using in creative ways that parallel conventional publication commission and subscription structures. I mean, Patreon has numerous flaws. I mean, not limited to its users' precarious reliance on the survival of a large and semi-volatile tech startup. However, the independence it gives to individuals and groups in terms of a ready-made platform they can use to fund themselves and distribute content is still relatively new enough to be considered a, a game changer, even though it's been around for a few years now. More good news is that though architecture criticism's reckoning with race is a long way to go, and I mean a really long way, Change at the editorial level has started to move in that direction, albeit what feels like a glacial pace. There are also organizations like the Architecture Lobby. Uh, those of you at Yale probably know such of such things from uh, Peggy Deemer, who I love, uh, which organize within architecture to make it more equitable, as well as a handful of nonprofits such as Critical Minded, which are devoted to funding and supporting emerging critics of color. Because let's be frank here, with a few notable exceptions, uh, notable wonderful exceptions. Architecture critic is about the whitest job you can get besides like maybe dog yoga and structure. So yeah. The key though to what I see is necessary to a radical transformation of architectural criticism is an attitude adjustment. To me personally, the feature of architecture criticism will be radically accessible and gloriously irre irreverent, not irrelevant, irreverent. The purpose of the statement is not to, you know, wag a finger at the eye tower or old guard architecture critics or my elders are betters. This is the rallying cry of someone who has stumbled upon a way to coax people outside of architecture into critically examining the built environment. Superimposing arrows and witty captions on pictures of ugly oversized houses isn't effective because it's funny or gimmicky or it's effective because it teaches people to look at buildings and see in their hidden language truths about society and culture. Slide. I think, I, mean, I don't know, maybe this is the last one. Oh, wrong one, nope, go back. Thought there was another slide. Go back, go back to the slide. Not a Q&A yet, we're almost there though. We're almost there, okay. I mean, I guess what else is a clueless cheap two-story portico if not a statement of wealth and power reduced to inadvertent self-mockery? I mean, we can bone the death of real criticism and worry about its future until the last light above the desk of the last newspaper architecture critic goes out for the last time. Or we can build something new in tone, choice of language, visual cues and medium, yet still constructive and productive. We can sustain criticism by giving it a new audience, the audience it deserves. Anyone affected by the change architecture creates in the built environment, which is to say every one. Criticism isn't just a branch of the big sprawling tree that is architecture. It's an innate sense that everyone has, but is rarely cultivated. People already see things in buildings that they find ugly, bland, insincere, pretentious. People already critique the politics of architecture every time they protest displacement, displacement border laws, or unethical labor practices. Scabby the Rat is personally my favorite architecture critic. So is the problem that people no longer care about real criticism or is it that real criticism doesn't care about people? Our duty as critics is to educate and empower the critic and others. If we do that, we will be unable to fit, build a future for our work. After all, what use is criticism if we write to an audience made up only of people like ourselves? Those who fret about the decline in quality or courtesy or the erosion of norms are often just fearful of the status quo changing. But who exactly benefits from the status quo? 
And what status quo hasn't already been eroded by the insanity that is the current political and cultural landscape or by the chaotic hegemonic rise of technology and its intentional disruption of pretty much everything. I mean, the world's on fire, yet so much, so much funded class energy is devoted to bemoaning the death of civility at the hands of angry Twitter users or the decay of thought or language because teens prefer to make memes instead of reading capital L literature. Personally, that wasn't me. The memes weren't around when I was a teenager. I mean, they were, but, but anyways. Instead of joining in such useless hand-wringing, architecture criticism would be wiser to harness the power of irreverence, constructively channel the energy of anger, and ultimately redirect the innate human desire to make sense of our senseless, upsetting world, building a better one, a more informed one, and a truly critical one, because the world is not gonna get easier. The political fracas we find ourselves in will not automatically revert to the last period in history in which you felt comfortable. The wa these waters are not only uncharted, but they are rising quickly. There's never been a time in the history of the built environment where the urgency and spirit of activism and criticism are so desperately needed. The field of architecture is not a friendly one. It's not an equitable one. And frankly, more often than not, it's not an inspiring one either. And so I leave you all with this. I'm here to tell you, students at the Yale School of Architecture and anyone who's listening, that you never, ever, ever have to accept things the way that they are. In fact, it is your duty to change them. Thank you. Okay, now I can go to the Q&A slide. <laughs> Amazing lecture, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we already have questions pouring in. Um, I'd like to remind the panelists or the participants to um, post the questions in the question and answer um, if you have one. And then if anyone wants one question answered before the other, please upvote it or click uh, by clicking on the like button. And we can start. Um, the first one, is by Finn Carpenter, who asks, what do you think about the tiny house movement? Is it an interesting and potentially egalitarian way to provide cheap housing? Or will it merely remain a fun, cute little lifestyle choice or for the petite bourgeois? Here's my opinion on tiny houses. I think that as architectural exercises, they're like, of course, yeah, they're deeply cute. It's fascinating to me see, to see how cleverly people can allocate small amounts of space. Uh, and in that, I think they're worthwhile endeavors. Uh, but I mean, really, like a tiny house is just a glorified tra trailer to me. Uh, it's, it's like basically a bourgeois trailer. Uh, and so I think that, yeah, there's definitely a class element there. And I don't think that tiny houses are the solution to like homelessness, for example. I mean, of course, a tiny house is better than no house. But what I don't understand is we don't just build housing, public housing, social housing, uh, housing for those who are vulnerable, uh, that is regular sized, right, and accessible. I don't understand why we have to use uh, poverty as an excuse to uh, do like cute little architectural projects or think about uh, poverty as like a design problem when it's a political problem. So I, I definitely have an issue with the tiny house framing is like, oh, it's gonna solve homelessness or it's gonna solve income inequality. But as far as like the objects, tiny houses as an object, I mean, of course, like they're fun and cute. And uh, I, I love for having that little stuff, little amount of stuff. I mean, you can look at my bookshelf behind me. Clearly this would not work in a tiny house. So that's my answer. Um, Kate asks, what books do you recommend as introductions to architectural theory? Oh, this is a good one. Uh, so for me, I started reading about architecture theory, mostly from anthologies of which there are many, the K. Michael Hayes anthology, architecture theory. Uh, I think it's like, what is it, nine, since 1968 is, is good. Um, and, but that's just, those are just collection of essays. Uh, actually my, what I started, the first book about architecture theory that I read was this one in, high school, which is Vincent Scully's American Architecture and Urbanism, which I recommend uh, because it's a really, really good uh, overview of the history of architecture in 
uh, in America, written by Vincent Scully, who is a great writer, great teacher. Uh, just he's like the most basically the most influential architecture teacher ever. And so I I highly recommend that. That's pretty accessible. And uh, yeah, anthologies definitely. The Kate Nesbitt anthology is good. Let me see what else do we have on here. Uh, yeah, those. I guess that's my answer. There's tons of anthologies of architectural theory, and they're mostly just uh, collections of of essays that were important in shaping the field of architecture uh, proper. So you can just kind of pick and choose which ones are interesting to you. So that's my answer there. Also, Manfredo Tafuri. You got to read Architecture and Utopia by Manfredo Tafuri. Wonderful. Okay, Simon asks, <laughs> what do you think is at the source of your fondness for brutalism? What about brutalism fascinates you? So I like brutalism a lot because I like the sort of retro futurism of it, obviously. I love the weightiness of it. I love how heavy it is. I love the materiality of it and the sort of tactile uh, touch sense that you get when you look at like brushed concrete, board form concrete, corduroy concrete. Uh, it's, it's really uh, an aesthetic preference of mine. And, and I, there's something, I have a sort of nostalgia for it. I went to high school in a brutalist high school. There's something that invokes a kind of longing uh, in some cases, a longing for like a more robust and centralized government or a welfare state in cases of Britain and other places in Europe, uh, a longing for like, like a, a modernity that kind of didn't deliver on its promises. Uh, and they're, it's, they're kind of lonely buildings. And I have felt sort of lonely all my life and identified with that. Um, but yeah, it's, so in, in some respects, I can give as many, I think they're fascinating flashpoints in terms, brutalism is a fascinating flat flashpoint for architectural discourse because like you either love or hate it and there's really no other style of architecture that invokes such vehemence and just normal people. And I think that it's a great way to interface with larger discussions of the role brutalism plays, for example, like with the state, uh, whether it's the welfare state, the carceral state, the state in general or as a whole, with narratives of utopianism and the failure of that utopianism for political reasons, with trauma, uh, and also with, there's also a narrative of hope in there and a desire for a better world. And all of those things are relevant to us today. And so that's that's why I love brutalism so much. And, and also I just think it looks cool, sci-fi. <laughs> totally agree with that. Um... Cap asks, can you talk a little bit about your love of cycling and how you recently adapted uh, your writing to a very different subject matter? Oh, I love cycling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can see, I guess I can turn my, we have my uh, bike on the trainer here. You can see, uh, but so I actually, so the thing about me is I didn't learn how to ride a bike until I was in middle school. And I never really rode a bike until I moved to Chicago. But my husband has ridden bikes all his life. Hi, honey. And has, uh, he's watching in his office right now, actually. And his parents are cyclists. And I got a bike, was gifted a bike by my in-laws. I, and it was a nice bike. I was like, well, I have to ride this now. I have to be good. And it, I discovered that I could use my body for things that weren't sitting and uh, <laughs> eating. So it was, it was actually really relevatory that like I could find joy in my own body in a way that I hadn't before. Uh, and enjoy it and feeling like an athlete and feeling like I had succeeded in, in doing something that is like just a sheer testament of will and strength. Uh, and so in terms of uh, adapting my writing to that, well, I mean, I love professional cycling too. Like I wake up early every morning to watch cycling in a group chat full of people, some of whom are in here actually right now. Hi, everyone. Uh, and it's, it's become a social thing for me. And it also like, I mean, I love cycling because of the romanticism of it. It's like man versus machine versus nature versus man. Every literary trope, longing for suffering, the triumph over the body and the will. I mean, the, the desire for victory and dominance, all of this is just so, so, so self-sacrifice, sacrifice for members of your team. Uh, so much romantic tropes in there that I find just like as a writer to be quite literary. And so it, I find it to be really natural to adapt to writing about, about cycling, which I hope to do more of uh, in the future. Amazing, okay. Alexander asks, what is your opinion of the prevalence of Pinterest and other applications and services that 
aggregate the visual culture. Is this a help or a hindrance for the development of a critical visual culture? Pinterest is an interesting one. Actually, usually people ask me about in Instagram. Um, but Pinterest is actually an interesting one because aside from the fact that like Pinterest has ruined Google image search, like I have to have a plugin on my, on my like internet browser so to like block Pinterest to come from coming up in Google image search because it's just, it just like sucks uh, like all kinds of, it just like totally eats up those search results. And when you click on an image from Pinterest, it's like log into Pinterest. It's like, no, I don't want to. <laughs> I haven't logged into Pinterest from like since like 2012 when I was pinning ideas for really dorky music tattoos that I never got, thank God. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, you're all very, like, I'm very lucky I didn't end up getting like a treble clef behind my ear or something stupid <laughs> like that. It was very close. Uh, so I think that, uh, well, Pinterest is in interesting because Pinterest is, is more of like an aggregational tool, which I think actually aggregation is useful. Like academics use Zotero, for example, I use Zotero to aggregate citations. And I use, of course, like Pocket to remember article read later. Uh, and so I, and I, even though I feel like I never end up actually going back to check it. So I feel like aggregation in terms of Pinterest, like how it like uses like web, web development to suck up the internet is terrible. But I feel that aggregation is like is like a natural and collection is a natural sort of human impulse. And I feel like that that's much less detrimental to design discourse than like Instagram, for example, which I feel encourages homogeneity uh, and image seeking uh, and attention seeking in a way that I personally disagree with. I mean, I use my Instagram to take pictures of my sewing projects and my bike um, and my life. And uh, I but it's like the impulse to curate your life for Instagram is so strong mm -hmm. that uh, I, I think it has like, I, I mean, it's documented to have like impacts on like mental health and like young people and things like that. So I don't know how necessarily widespread that is. And I think obviously Instagram serves like a very specific purpose. Um, and there's lots of people I follow on Instagram who I, I love, like I, that's how I keep track of, that's what most of my friends from college use. Like I wouldn't know what anyone was doing if it wasn't for Instagram. So, I mean, it's a mixed bag because the human nature to communicate and to communicate through images is, um, is it's natural, uh, but at the same way that Instagram and especially the financialization of Instagram has developed over the last few years, I think it's detrimental uh, ultimately to, uh, to architecture uh, and design as a whole. But I think also it could be improved in some way in terms of, again, like, this is something that has to do with building critical institutions that it's like, hey, not everything you see on Instagram is real. Uh, and just because you see like people doing Moroccan tiles on Instagram doesn't mean that like we all have to do it now. Um, you do not have to line up for eight hours to go into the Museum of Ice Cream. Uh, I went once and I was underwhelmed. That's <laughs> my critical opinion. Okay, um, Anonymous asks, you mentioned that architecture criticism is an innate sense that everyone says, but has rarely cultivated. How do you feel that aligns or diverges from recent fringe question mark proposals that neoclassical architecture is an aesthetic to be valued above all else? This is like the kind of, okay, so like now we're getting into the territory of like the anti-modernism culture war like on Twitter and stuff like that uh and uh through like uh the what is it the fine arts National Institute of Fine Arts whatever it was what is it uh NCAS yeah National, yeah NCAS which I don't remember what it stands for but that's the organization and that like is all aligned with Trump and is like yeah all new federal buildings are going to be uh, National Civic Arts Society thank you uh, are that are, have to be you know tra you know trad and tradition. It's it's funny because like ar like architecture in America kind of always been sort of traditional. Modernism was important here, but not nearly as important as it was in Europe uh, or Asia. And so I think that uh, Americans have always sort of like gravitated towards sort of traditional architecture, especially residential architecture, just because that's what they know. That's what they grew up in. Uh, that's what they see, like, semiotically speaking, is, like, uh, a, a pitched roof and a red door is, is home to a lot of people. And, like, I don't think that's necessarily something to be, you know, poo-pooed at. But I definitely think that the culture war in architecture has developed as, like, a, really a dog whistle. It's, like, a, it's sort of like an anti-Semitic dog whistle. Uh, and it's definitely an anti-communist uh, sentiment. 
that uh, art that modern architecture is somehow degenerate or somehow ruins lives, which just the facts of that is just not true. I mean, modern architecture housed more people in such a short amount of time that would just be simply impossible otherwise. And uh, so much of the infrastructure of everyday life from hospitals, to logistics to uh, you know, schools, et cetera, rely on modernist architects, architecture or, or, or architectural concepts and innovations that were developed in modernism. And so I think that it's, I mean, neoclassical architecture, which, I mean, we're talking specifically, it's like, there's like a lot of neoclassicisms. Like there's of course, like, you know, DC Beaux-Art classicism, which is like what the culture war is all about. Or there's, uh, but there's also just like McMansion neoclassicism too. And so, I mean, those are very different neoclassicisms from one another for class reasons, for uh, money reasons, for time, historical reasons. And so, mm, I don't know. Uh, I think that you like what you like, but there's also good and bad neoclassical architecture. And so, I mean, that's really the project in McMansion Hell is like getting people to tell the difference. Like, I like a lot of traditional architecture, like hands down. I Every Italianate row house I see makes every like Richardsonian Romanesque, like Diocletian window makes my little heart go a flutter. So it's, uh, I'm like a modernist at heart, but I have a great deal of love for classicism. And so did most of the modern architects that are really famous, like Le Cabousier, for example. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my really long-winded answer, like I promised on the slide. <laughs> Um, I don't know how much longer do you, you have to answer questions, but we have 23 more questions. So I, did you, um, do you know? Yeah, you can I can let me know do, I can do a few more. I'm like not in a hurry. So uh, I say do, I, I can see them from here. So I can, I can pick awesome. some maybe. Oh, okay. Uh, someone, asked, someone asked me what kind of bike do I ride? I ride a 2000 Bianchi Volpe. It's great, great bike. <laughs> got uh, Shimano Tiagra components and uh, Celeste Green bar tape. Anyways, okay, that one's answered. Uh, let's see, I'm scrolling through here. Also, do you like metabolism? Yes, uh, <laughs> definitely, very much so. Uh, let's see. All these are kind of shifting in around. <laughs> uh, but architects seem to love to design chairs, which I'm just going through the ones that are really, really quick. Uh, yeah. Architects seem to love to design chairs. What's your favorite chair? Uh, my favorite chair is the womb chair by Aero Saarinen because it's the only like famous architect chair that like fits my five foot three body. Uh, like if I lay in an Eames chair, like the ergonomics are like all off and it's like not comfortable for me. Uh, a lot of those Eames chairs just like actually sit in the wrong place in my back. So uh, kudos to the womb chair for supporting short kings like me. Uh, what font did you use for the presentation? I actually have a friend who is really into typefaces and sent me a zip file full of, of, of fonts because I was like, what's a weird font for this? And so I don't actually know the name off the top of my head, but it's one that I picked from there. And uh, yeah, so uh, I think it's a cool font personally. I guess I, can, I can't really open PowerPoint right now, but uh, it's one, it's a free font. I know that. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to go up, back up the 10. Uh, how do you think architects can engage in housing slash land use policy? This is a question I actually hate tackling um, because I, I'm not an urbanist and I'm not a land use guy. And like the Yimby Fimby NIMBY thing just like washes right over my head. I like believe what I believe politically and operate on a micro level through that, those instincts. Uh, and so for me, I feel like this is like a really vitriolic thing that goes down mostly in California, but in other places. And I think that architects like have a duty to provide affordable housing for as many people as possible and in the most like equitable way. And that's my answer straight up right there. Um, so I guess like if you're seeking like, you know, nonprofit developers, for example, or uh, social housing or low income housing or at risk housing. I think that that's imperative and you can look at the work at Peter Barber in England is a great example of how to make equitable housing like beautiful and endearing. Uh, and so I think that the, provi the provision of shelter is the key duty of architecture above all else. And I, I think that uh, politically speaking, uh, it's something that, you know, architects should take seriously and engage with. Uh, 
but that's not, it's not, I'm not an expert in land use uh, whatsoever. And it's not something I like to talk about because it is really, really interesting. And I, uh, there's, it feels like there's never enough I can learn before uh, parsing that discourse. So uh, I have lots of like really gifted individuals and friends who, who work in that sphere, specifically at places like Tenants Together in California, if you're talking about California. Uh, so I recommend checking out those sort of community driven organizations as well. Okay. Well, what do you think about the concept of good faith? <laughs> no, as yeah, because the thing is, uh, the <laughs> questions will keep moving around on you, and that's very distracting for some some speakers. So that's the only reason. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I guess we can take. Let's take like three more. How about that? Perfect. Perfect. So, what do you think about the concept okay. of good taste? Sometimes criticism is misconstrued as snobbery, and I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Okay. So first of all. I want to say that having good taste is not the same as like being a good critic. I mean, look at my blazer. I'm like dressed like a composition notebook. Like <laughs> I have like an Ikea Calyx bookshelf, uh, like in my office with my bike on a trainer. I mean, I think that good taste is relative. I think also if you have bad taste, you can just like live with it. Like you shouldn't be like, you shouldn't insist that like your bad taste is good taste. Actually, That's really stupid. Don't do that. Uh, like if you say if like it's like I'd be like Disney movies are like better than like Antonioni movies or whatever or Scorsese movies it's like oh, come on man just just say that you like it and like get over it you know uh, I definitely think that it's it's something that I think taste becomes sort of relevant and less, more relevant or less relevant depending on the situation and considering the fact that Donald Trump is the president right now and like he's just basically known for doing like really big gilded Versailles pseudo Versailles uh, condos in New York I feel like taste has like re-entered the argue the the public discourse in a way that it hasn't for a really long time but also I feel like a lot of markers of good taste it's like oh I listen to this American life or like you know drink Chianti or whatever are really just class signifiers like masked as aesthetic signifiers and that bothers me um and so I I think that in a lot of ways uh I think you can have fun with taste I think that you know the pressure to like have all your, your tastes be good is stupid I mean, I like to listen to Carly Rae Jepsen when I work out and that's fine, that's legal. Uh, <laughs> so I think that, uh, I think that you just gotta own your taste no matter what, uh, whether it's good or bad. Like, I feel like I have good taste in architecture, but there's also like architecture that I like that like a lot of people really hate. I mean, brutalism, obviously, uh, but also, I mean, there's like those modern buildings that I just like adore that like, you know, nobody likes. Uh, <laughs> I think about Charles Moore a lot. If you're not an architect, probably would look, look at a Charles Moore building and be like, what is, what is this, you know? Uh, and so I think that, uh, yeah, that's, that's my opinion there. I think no matter what your taste is, you have to own it and accept it for what it is, good or bad. Uh, and don't be so serious about it, I guess. That's, uh, don't be self-conscious about what you like, just like it and, you know, don't force it on other people, but like, don't get into like, let people enjoy things discourse. Uh, like, own up to criticism when it comes like I people are critical of the things that I like all the time like so much so 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 much and yet you know I just make peace with it in fact like I find that often like if something like critically engages with something that I really really like that I like it more after that because I I've added nuance to the to the pleasure that I take in it uh and I know more about something than I did before and that also adds to the enjoyment and so I think embracing criticism is not as a personal attack but as a way of interfacing with the subject and uh, expanding knowledge, I think is really uh, an important uh, task that we have to sort of take upon ourselves so that we don't get too defensive about everything because that's not very fun. And life's, life should be more fun. <laughs> okay, Kyle, what are your thoughts on the typically bemoaned prefab double, double wides of rural America? So actually, I think that double wides are really a really fascinating uh, study in the different attitudes towards modular housing and mass manufactured housing, which is something that like has always been in the architectural discourse um, as long as, ma as mass production has really existed. And so you have like, you know, architects like Paul Rudolph uh, for one, and then you also have architects like, you know, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill who did mass prefab um, sort of like low density dwelling proposals and some of which were really successful. 
and which we're not in the case of poverty, we're not successful whatsoever. And so it's interesting to me that like when architects are like, okay, we're going to build low density uh, prefabricated houses, it's somehow like noble and forward thinking. But like when, you know, people buy a trailer, it's somehow like irredeemable or like class or like unclassy or something. And so I definitely think it's like this, one of those things, it's like alcoholism. It's like fashionable when celebrities do it, but like normal people like can't get away with it. Uh, <laughs> and I think that it's, sorry, maybe that was a little cruel. Uh, I think that uh, it's, it's, there's class signifiers at work, but in terms of like as a successful project in mass manufactured housing, the double wide is, is like a really important foundation of like American vernacular, vernacular architecture. Uh, in modernism is fundamentally a modernist car, uh, car based and delivery based um, uh, development. And so I think, I would think it's a fascinating subject that deserves a lot more attention in terms of history. I would read a book like 500 pages on how the double wide was developed. And that book do isn't, that doesn't exist and it should. And I think that uh, I definitely really think it's something that more critical and more historical attention should be uh, paid to pay to. And actually, uh, to give like a little bit of a recommendation here, since you all like book recommendations, highly recommend uh, Discovering the Vernacular Landscape by John Bringerhoff Jackson. J.B. Jackson, one of my favorite guys, love him or hate him. A lot of people, it's one or the other. But I, he had a really like wonderful, uh, critical and algaic way of writing about uh, about these these kinds of American vernacular landscapes. I think he apologizes for them a little bit too much and is not sufficiently critical of, of, of them and the systems that brought them into existence. But at the same time, the way that he writes about them are, is very, very humanizing uh, and gives, a, gives an important history uh, to things like the strip mall or like the mobile home. And so I recommend that book. Awesome. Okay, we can make this the last one. Um, it is, what are your thoughts on the use of other media such as video games and other works of fiction, novels, movies, etc., cetera, to, dem to democratize and create a conversation about social issues that currently existing in the field of, that are currently existing in the field of architecture? That's a really good question. So there was a, um, so in this like past year, 2019's uh, architecture, tri also architecture triennial, the curators decided instead of doing a big coffee table book of all the exhibitions to do like a small volume of like basically uh, like creative uh, fiction, nonfiction, comic books, uh, like explorations of, of life after growth, degrowth, it was this degrowth was the theme and that was much more engaging and, and much more, and was like a wonderful way of engaging with the subject rather than just like pictures of the exhibition. And I think that this is something that actually like science fiction does incredibly well. Um, like if you talk about like world building, right? Or if you talk about like, you know, Frank Herbert, Ursula K. Le Guin, Philip K. Dick, if you talk uh, about Stanley Robinson to add like a contemporary example, architecture plays a huge role in the narratives of those, of those novels uh, and the speculative nature of them. And this goes for video games too, which interface with architecture in a really interesting way. I mean, the video game I play right now is Zwift and Zwift architecture is always really funny to me because you can tell the guys who made Zwift from California and everything is California centric. Uh, but I think that uh, video games are like an immersive way and these immersive interactive uh, like new media kind of narratives and forms by which uh, people um, inter interface with, with architecture. I think that, that that's ultimately good and it, it I'm all for like multi-sensory experiences. That's why I became an acoustician was because uh, buildings are like enjoyed in three dimensions with all of our senses. And I feel like the tyranny of the visual is something that uh, is really a weakness in architectural discourse and understanding. And so like listening to a building is totally different experience than looking at one. Uh, and uh, I just wanna take the chance to answer the last question here, oh, sure. which is that which is about Manfredo Tafuri, uh, who are not Yaleys, but rather regular folks who spend most of our time in or near buildings. I mean, I'm not a Yale either. <laughs> I went to the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, Greensboro the greatest school that ever lived, sorry Yale. Uh, but <laughs> I think that, sorry, shout out to UNCG. Uh, but uh, so about Tafuri, so 
so people ask me like for recommendations of architecture theorists and architecture theory is like inherently dense and sort of jargony because it's basically the melding of, of philosophy which is dense and jargony with architecture which has its own density and jargon and so together they're really dense and jargony but Manfredo Tafari uh, is my favorite architecture theorist for a number of reasons uh, one because he had a political vision that was you know closely aligned with mine uh, and second, because he, I mean, he, the guy fundamentally be believed in a better world and he believed that architecture wasn't living up to it, wasn't living up to any of its promises, wasn't interfacing with politics in the way that it needed to, had a like a problematic way of dealing with its recent past. And so if you like are, uh, if you are really, really, really interested in architecture theory, I highly recommend to Furry, uh, but I'm not going to pretend like to is an easy part to read. Um, in fact, if you want a architecture theory is always really dense, but if you want a writer who's like a little bit more uh, like rhapsodic, I guess, and less dense, though still dense, let, let me be very clear here. There's no way escaping density when we're talking about architecture theory, which is it's like I said in my talk, it's it's main weakness. Uh, I mean, Frederick Jameson is a great is a great theorist to read. Uh, he's more of a cultural critic, uh, and so he takes more of a cultural criticism approach to theory than uh, to Furry, who was a pure theorist. Uh, and so, yeah, I like I like to Furry because I I agree with everything he says, uh, and he says things in ways that are that I can't say them because I don't write like that, and I uh, and yeah. So this this is a. Uh, but Tafuri is not essential reading for architecture. If you just, if you're in and around buildings and you like buildings, there's some books I can recommend that would you'd probably get a lot more out of than reading Tafuri. Uh, just turning around here, back back into my shelf here. I mean, I highly recommend reading books by critics. Uh, I highly recommend reading literally anything Michael Sorkin ever wrote. Uh, I love him and I, when he passed away from coronavirus, I was extremely upset and I'm still upset and I don't want to talk about it. Um, and I also recommend, uh, you know, any, there's like anthologies of work by Italy Huxtable. My favorite book by hers is The Unreal America. Um, if you want to start getting into architecture theory, I recommend Vincent Scully, who is really approachable. Uh, I, rec I also recommend Rainer Banham, if you really like wit and you like weird 70s buildings, he's a good one. Charles Jenks is funny. Um, Though I don't want to give anyone here Charles Jenks brain. I suffer from that and it's a terminal condition. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I, I really, there's so many great books about architecture. One of my favorite books about architecture is The Field Guide to American Houses, which is, uh, you know, just, I can look at that book forever and never get tired of it. Um, so there's, there's just, there's a lot, a uh, lot of great, a lot of great writing out there in architecture. Oh, Spiro Kostov, that's, he's also a really good, uh, the history of architecture by Spiro Kostov is a really good primer on, on history of architecture. So I think that book's out of print now, but it's big. It's kind of a coffee table book and it's got really pretty pictures. Um, let's see here. Most of my architecture books are actually in the other room in my main bookshelf here. But so that's what I've got for you so far uh, in terms of books to check out. Uh, but yeah, I'd say like if you're American and you want to get a sort of a grasp on American architecture, again, American architecture and urbanism by Vincent Scully is where I started when I was a teenager. And uh, look where I am now. So <laughs> I highly recommend that. My face back on in order to thank you, Kate. Uh, thank totally, you. Totally fantastic. Thank you all of our many, many, many guests. And um, Come visit us in our brutalist building as soon as travel is safe. We will welcome you with open arms. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much again for having me. This was wonderful. It was great. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>